So Infinity War comes out. Tony Stark wearing your sunglasses, walking out New York, seeing Thanos' crew drop in. It's a huge deal. I mean, you're talking about millions upon millions of people seeing this, building hype around a product. It was a shock to us. It was just luck. Someone put that frame in that man's hands and the rest is history. Robert Denny Jr. has appeared as Tony Stark in nine movies across Marvel's cinematic universe, wearing over 30 different pairs of glasses. In Spider-Man Far From Home, his glasses became an extension of Tony Stark and a character of their own. So how did a pair of sunglasses become the star of a billion dollar movie? The designer of the frame is Big Mike. He's been with the company for 25 years. He's a big comic book nerd, loves all that stuff. So he was the one that came out here and said, I want to design something Tony Stark-ish. Well, yeah, that's one thing we do whenever we start designing for a new collection. We always pick, for a man, we always pick a new face. So in the past, it's been um, Paul Newman. We did Steve McQueen one time. I mean, obviously, King of Cool, right? You got to do him. And then when it came to that collection, we, we had Robert Downey Jr.'s face on the wall. A lot of times when we design our products, we have people in mind. We have celebrities or personas that we create. And for the Flight 6 specifically, we use Tony Stark as an inspiration. So if you look back at some of our earlier sketches and some of our earlier concepts, we have frames where we've put him on his face. I want to say maybe 2012, he was wearing a frame of ours called the Hate On. And for us, that was also another big hit. So once that Iron Man role started to evolve and he became this persona and kind of cleaned up his act a little bit, that we started looking to that character as a design inspiration. Because if you look at the Flight 6, what's the DNA of that frame? It's an aviator, right? But I think where we shine as a brand and what our design team does so well is they take a concept of a chassis, right? And then they build upon that to add a little bit of flair without being over the top, you know, taking a little bit of restraint and making something that this character would wear. Perfect example, we made these crazy blades a few years back and we called it the Lady Gaga frame. This is what Lady Gaga would wear. Back when she was really over the top, you know, with a crazy meat dress, you know, really out there. And sure enough, one month after the frame released, we see on one of the paparazzi sites, there she is wearing the Lady Gaga frame. So for us, being able to create something with a specific person in mind and actually see that through, without anything from our end, it's like we did everything right. We did everything that we intended to do design-wise, and it happened. Inspiration started when Robert Downey Jr. visited the DITA office back in the late 90s. When we met Robert Downey Jr., it was it was exciting because I was a I'm a child of the 80s, so you know, Less Than Zero is a big movie for me. And he he comes rolling in, but this is you got to remember this is at a time when he wasn't the in the in the best place in his life. You know, he was like you could tell like something was going on with him. So he comes in and he's he, he I remember the he was so focused on the. Uh, the, the frame warmers. So we heat, when we quality control a frame, we heat up the plastic and we adjust it. So he was just so tripped out that these things blew out this hot air and he, we wouldn't start, stop playing with them. We wanted to do something that wasn't maybe so ornate and heavily Dita detailed frame, something that was a little bit more subtle, but a uh, eccentric billionaire would wear. He was Tony Stark. So, you know, it made sense and it ended up paying off. I mean, it, it's just, it's weird the way, the coincidence, how it, how it happened, how it went down. Help him! Anna, Bob, go go on. On. Got it. It's Friday, what am I looking at? Not sure, I'm working on this. When the movie dropped and the first trailers came out, it was like a, oh my gosh, out of the blue. Here we are in the Infinity War with Robert Downey Jr., which, an icon among icons in terms of eyewear. Man's known for wearing all kinds of frames. He's worn our stuff in the past as well and is someone that we reflect upon as a, a source of inspiration. You know, obviously the guy wearing all kinds of eyewear and he's probably, in my opinion, the coolest superhero there is, right? He doesn't have superpowers. He's just a badass. He's smart. He's a genius. Makes everything on his own. They did filming so quickly for the sequel for Endgame that Tanya Howard from Prop Specs reached out to us, who's an amazing frame stylist, and said, hey, I need four of these frames. Stat, 
it's a big deal, it's gonna be in the next movie and possibly another movie, but she couldn't really share the details because she was under NDA. So my first reaction is, Tanya who? I don't know this person, I don't have this relationship. And as you can imagine in the position that we're in, people hit us up all the time. Oh, I'm representing so-and-so, I'm Adele's manager, I'm a Snoop Dogg stylist, right? So we have to vet everything. I vetted Tanya, she was legit, she's an optician, she's been in the industry for a very long time, uh, very respectable. I am very familiar with Dita, I've been in the optical industry for 31 years, and so I'm extremely familiar with their styling, I love it, it's one of my favorites, um, the craftsmanship and the and just their, their and it's an understated elegance, and I love that about them, it's very stylish. Um, I wanted to include them because I think that Robert needed that sort of edge. I researched his character a little bit and I, uh, I found he has an edge and he needs and he's very stylish and so I wanted to pick out the most stylish frames for him. I, he's, he's known for his glasses. Eyewear used to be uh, the um, responsibility of wardrobe or costumes and I'm not really sure when it switched over but now it is the responsibility of props. It's considered a prop. So now I deal with prop men people. <laughs> uh, I work with one of the most famous prop masters out there, Russell Bobbitt, and um, he asked me to pick out about 20 different pair that he would, that uh, Robert Downey Jr. would look good in for this character, and he didn't really tell me much about it. I don't get any scene references. I don't get anything. They usually say, you know, we need 10 looks for this, for this actor. Give us this type of look and anything you think would look good on this person. It's not about the character, it's about a look. So the notes that they give me are not necessarily about a character. They, there's not, there's, they can't tell me too much. So I just have to go off of, okay, we want a look sort of like this, uh, and, and we want this type of color in there, what do you think? They ask my opinions on that. He gives me an idea, and we actually had a video conf conference, and he showed me about certain things that he, maybe he wanted uh, some uh, gave me samples of looks that he would possibly want, and I went out and I chose about 20 that I thought would look good. Robert Downey had a fitting. I was unfortunately not able to go, but um, and then they chose about six or seven from that from those uh, initial 20, and um, I guess the one that made it to screen was the Dita 006. So here we are. We're all excited, right? Infinity War came out. It's a huge thing. We're feeling like rock stars. We sent a bunch of frames out for Endgame. I take the whole team down in marketing department. We go down to the local movie theater and we're saying, okay, let's go see this movie. Opening day. Everyone takes the afternoon off. We're all sitting there and we're all watching the movie and it goes through the entire film and even post credit scene hoping for these flight sixes to pop up and nothing. Everybody on my team didn't say a single word. I had to be the one to break the ice and say, well, that, that was odd. He was wearing a lot of other frames, which it happens. You know, you're working in Hollywood, things end up on the cutting room floor. We can't control those things, but you know, that's the reality of working within that business, right? A little bit on the sad side, a little bit disappointed, but we move on. So we're thinking it's done, you know, it's written off. And then somehow these frames ended up in the trailer for Spider-Man Far From Home. After I did uh, Infinity War and Endgame, um, the the Dita Flight Six blew. I, I, I it was just such a sensation. A, a few months went by, and I got contacted by this production company in London, asking me if I can get those frames. I reached out to Cody at Dita, and he was so awesome and so generous and so just willing to help me in any way possible. He he. He, he supplied me the frames and made it all happen. Um, I had no idea the extent that this frame would, the, the, the role it would play in the Spider-Man movie. The extent that this frame was used in Spider-Man Far From Home exceeded anything that we could even imagine. This is another character of the film. Yeah, the frame and the lens now is a unique combination. It's almost like you know, giving birth to a whole new creature. It's something that we never foresaw, and it becomes this unique icon of a frame. The blue was chosen um, because it, we want to see the actor's eyes, yet not see reflection. So a blue was a good contrast against that frame color. And we don't want to make it too dark, because then you won't be able to see the actor's eyes. You wanted to make it what it wound up to be. 
so we went with a blue number two, basically in the optical world, that's what it's called. And I put my special coating on there and voila. It didn't bother me, I asked, I was curious like why the lenses were different and then I was explained that in movies you gotta have special lenses and it made sense because the original color did have a flash which is a type of mirror and you don't want reflections of camera lenses and stuff like that. So it, it, it immediately hit me and I understood why. You know, you could still see the frame, you could still see all the details. Most of the time he would send me the frames and we would discuss all, uh, color options, but usually he has an idea. Everyone on the set has an idea of what they want in there. With my business, it's all about the anti-reflective coating. Okay, so it's, you know, so you cannot see the reflections of the camera or crew or anything going on. Uh, so within that, in my world, there are different options available that a lot of people don't know about and different color hues of anti-reflective coating. So I discuss with them which would be best on their, on the tint that they're asking for, things like that. So I get the text, usually from an assistant, said we're FedExing you some frames, call when you receive them, we'll talk about it, we have a discussion. I then make a phone call to my lab and I say, I need this, I need this, I need that. So I discuss what I need. And because I've been in the industry so long, I can speak optical speak to them. They know exactly what I'm talking about and they can go ahead and start. I've been asked the question of how did, is that the real color that you made? Or it kind of looks different than the one in Infinity War and Endgame. I said, yeah, they must have done that in post because that's, those aren't the, that's not the color I sent out. And so now I understand why they changed it because it's, supposed to have super powers, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> have, have you seen the movie? No. <laughs> Embarrassingly, no. When the DVDs are available, I purchase the DVDs and I have them, but they're still not unwrapped. <laughs> but yeah, I just, <laughs> but um, I think I've tried to watch some of them, but I just want to see my own stuff. I don't really know storylines or characters or I don't speak Marvel. I don't know any of that. The first one I did was Ant-Man. Uh, the second one I did was Captain America uh, with the with the red tint and the and the silver strip of mirror on top. That frame originally had a, a gray lens or black lens or something with silver on top. And when they proposed this to me and they said, this is a long shot, but can we do maybe a different color and do the anti-reflective coating on the colored part, but still have the silver on top? I said, sure. Now I say sure to everything. I say yes to everything, and when I hang the phone up, I start freaking out. But for somehow, it all comes together and it works out perfectly. Uh, that started out as an all-in frame, um, a anodized red all-in frame in the movie. Um, we were told they were about three weeks into filming. We actually hadn't gotten to the set on that one yet. Um, but we had uh, colored those frames, set those frames up. We even made all the frames for Chris Evans um, for the aviators for that. Because when you're watching that film, they started off um, both good. And then I don't know if I'd consider it by calling them both evil, but their suits darkened. So it was something that, uh, that I thought was uh, amazing that Russell did with those where they basically started with uh, their regular suits and ended up uh, as characters that were much darker. So we basically made sunglasses that match with that. So they started off with a regular red anodized and went to one that actually had um, antiquing done to it to make it look darker for both, um, uh, for both Tony Stark and also for Captain America. That piece was the gift that was gonna be given out to everybody that was on set. So we actually made an additional 75 of those that had uh, a different inscribing on them that was the actual gift for everybody on set for that. And then um, that changed because uh, Robert came to the set wearing that police frame and uh, they decided that they liked that one because it had the metal bridge on the top there. Um, so uh, we were contacted and uh, when that happened, we went ahead and contacted Dorigo, who is actually the company that owns police. And um, I do know a few people that work for them at that time, the national sales manager, and then also one of the uh, people in Italy that's um, uh, it's basically vice president. So um, we contacted them and say, we'd like to partner up on this. So we got those all from police, from Dorigo. Um, 
So they had, uh, that frame came in about 12 different colors. So basically what we did is um, acquired uh, a lot of them, um, the majority of them, I think a few thousand of them. Um, and uh, we knew that our clientele would be wanting that frame right away and want multiple colors of it. So basically we just got those all set and then um, had those lenses made here in the States. That was a huge, I remember seeing that, uh, we were sitting at a bar uh, for Super Bowl. And I remember when the trailer hit, was started playing during Super Bowl, one of the Super Bowl ads was the trailer. And I was like, oh my God, that's my frame. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Jason and his team at Initium Eyewear have been working with Marvel for nearly a decade. Initium is responsible for more of Stark's eyewear than any other brand. We actually started with Iron Man 2. And with that movie, there was a prop master at that time that um, was doing all his own prop, props, making everything for that movie, and happened to be, actually just get an Initium frame and thought that it kind of had a rock and roll vibe to it and was something different and unique. They contacted us directly and uh, asked for a sample set of our frames to see what other options we had, what was available. We basically will get an email or a call from them. They'll say we need, you know, this character or this character and so on. But at the very start there, what we did was just send over all the options we had frame-wise. Eyewear is iconic. You look at Tom Cruise, Risky Business, the Men in Black, Matrix, iconic frames, Morpheus wearing these floating rimless frames but it's not part of the story. So to go there and have this level where this frame follows from start to finish throughout the whole film, we've been very blessed and very fortunate to have that opportunity. There's no other accessory that can really change a character. I mean, imagine would Tony Stark be Tony Stark if he didn't have freaking sunglasses and the whole time he's talking about how, you know, his contacts are falling out of his eyeballs or something like that. Like, you need to have those things. And, and some, no other accessory does it like a pair of sunglasses. I think, to, to me, I think eyeglasses really top off the outfit. So they really, like, put the finishing touches on whatever you're wearing, because they can match whatever, so whether you're wearing a suit, a jumpsuit, jeans and a t-shirt, if you're at a beach, you know, it just collectively pulls you in and tops off the outfit. People are wearing it because, we, you know, we got race car drivers and stuff like that. Those, to me, those guys are the coolest dudes. You know, dudes that risk their lives just to go fast. You know, we have pilots. We have Red Bull Air Racer pilots. You know, those guys, like, just having them wear my frames, is, that's, that's an honor in itself. Mike's story with Dita starts in the 90s, working in the warehouse. Just initially got hired on the company for just doing basic quality control. And then as things got more technical, it just started jumping in because, you know, people needed somebody to, you know, we needed somebody to cut lenses and we didn't have anybody to cut lenses. So when we got the machine, I said, you know, I volunteered, I'll do it. You know, it sounds fun. When we started tinting lenses, we got a lens tinting machine. No one knew how to tint lenses. Raised my hand again, you know, never looked back. And one day, just got a computer, started designing while I was tinting and cutting lenses. And next thing you know, here I am. I think it was 21. Just random shot, my buddy, that was actually the first employee when they moved to LA, called me up and said, you know, I got a job and we need one more guy. And it was supposed to be a job for the summer. And, you know, ended up being a career. I was in between, you know, I was in a, in a part of my life where I was just, I was in between where I was, what I was gonna be. I was either gonna join the Marines or I was gonna go back to school. And I took this job and we were right in the heart of Hollywood and being a sunglass company in the middle of Hollywood is like kind of a cool thing. You start getting, you know, celebrities and rock stars rolling in because we're in the middle of Hollywood and so accessible. And the next thing you know, we we're going to every single concert backstage. It was like, I don't think I want to leave yet. <laughs> it was always something I helped the, the founders. I, I would always draw. Right. And so the founders, they, 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 they would see me, the guys that founded the company, they, Jeff and John, they, they saw me drawing and, they would ask for advice on, you know, if I could draw a temple for this or, you know, you know, draw a lens shape for that. And back then it was it was really, really archaic. Like we were we were literally drawing one side of a frame on a piece of paper that was folded in half. And then we would, you know, copy the other side because it was it was just vellum. You could see through it. And then that's the way we, we would design frames. And then from there it evolved into we would coat just generic plastic frames and in automotive bondo and we would file it by hand and get dirty and get, we called it the lung because we weren't wearing masks. <laughs> we would just cough and hack up 
Bondo dust for weeks at a time. And we've always had a huge library of vintage frames. So early on, I was really inspired by the old brands like the Dunhills and some of the old Jaguars and Cazals, of course, and stuff like Persols, especially. And just to see how they were they were produced and the quality that they they felt, it was really inspiring. I get excited. I always say, it, you know, my designs are my children. So it's like I release my children out to the world and take care of them. And when I see them out in the public, it's, it's, it's exciting. I still get excited every, every time I see something I do, I've, I've designed. Is it my favorite design? Mm, not really. It's probably my top 10. But for it being the movie, I mean, you can't, you, can't, you can't compare that, you know? You can't put a price on that. My favorite thing I've done? Like my favorite design or... Hmm. I always go back to my first one, which is a frame called the Marquee, uh, 2009, I believe. It's always because you never forget your first one, you know, in anything in life, you never forget it. You know, no matter what it is, your first car, your first girlfriend, you never forget it. So that I always go back. That's my favorite one. And I do almost on a weekly basis, go back and look at all the stuff I've done. I keep everything and I was like well a lot most of it is like what the hell was I thinking <laughs> but it's all a learning process so you gotta you know you gotta do things just over the top and then you whittle them down into something beautiful it's you know it's part of the process so from inspiration be it images objects, stuff like that. We go into sketch, which we do a lot of hand sketching here. From versions of sketch, we'll, you know, sketch it out, see what details we want to put. Is it going to be a round square? So with the Flight 6, it was a navigator shape, which is basically a square aviator. Then from hand sketching, we get, we put designs into Illustrator. The Illustrator files get submitted to the factories. From that illustration file, we get technical files, which like what you see here, but not so specific. There was maybe four iterations of this technical drawing. From those technical files, we go back and forth through different visions. It could be radiuses of corners, widths of bridges, the width of the lenses, stuff like that. From that technical drawing, we get a tooling sample. From the tooling sample, if we're happy with it, then we put it into production and it's a go from there. We're really into cars, planes, you know, anything that moves, machines. I mean, anything, we, we, we pull inspiration from anything. Last week, we we're doing a, a vault tour at one of the automotive mu museums in Los Angeles. When you think of the guys before, you know, that, that were working on those things and there were designers like us, they're in a studio just like this, you know? And they whipped up some beautiful cars, I mean, just beautiful cars. It's, it's inspiring. But that's part of our brand DNA is that, you know, we don't need to put the flashy logos on things. Granted, it makes it a little bit more difficult to people to find out about your brand, but the sales success that we've had with the Flight 6 is all in part of people that are hardcore fans of Marvel, of this cinematic universe, and going out there and figuring out what it is. I mean, there's threads on forums of people dedicated just to Tony Stark alone. I own about 310 pairs of sunglasses. It started back in 1996 with uh, Men in Black. I bought my first pair from the flea market. They were replicas, and I had them for probably four years. Then when X-Men came out, Cyclops' Oakley's Juliet's, they were like my new favorite pair. It almost makes you feel like you're another person, or like you're another, like a higher level of who you think you could be. He's a billionaire playboy, right? He's the top of the line from the cars that he drives in the films to his suits to the eyewear that he wears. Usually when he's wearing a suit, he's got a nice pair of sunglasses, and they're usually fairly expensive for Tony Stark, so he's got money, he's a billionaire. So he's gonna have the nicest frames, the nicest sunglasses. There's a whole new subset of fans of the Marvel Universe that have now been introduced to Dita. I've heard, yes. I've been contacted. <laughs> 
I have heard there's a collector community, yes. My involvement in the community is a lot on the Replica Props Forum. Uh, it's a forum where uh, collectors share their collections and identify other frames that people see in movies, TV shows, interviews, and commercials. And they're like a big family. You know, we have, there's a lot of members, probably a couple thousand, but there's about 10 or 12 that are active in the one forum that we're in with the Iron Man sunglasses specifically. I think it's awesome. You know, uh, eyewear has been in my life for, for a very long time, so I can see where it, it's like a pair of shoes. It's like a watch. People collect watches. It's an accessory. Eyeglasses are an accessory also, so why not? I think, that's, I think it's awesome. There's always more to be found. You can never really stop collecting sunglasses or stop wearing them. What we try to do with the collector community is um, uh, basically offer anything that they're looking for. For instance, Endgame was done. Uh, they went back in time. They did a bunch of frames that were 10 years old. They did a Tom Ford. He did quite a few frames compared to what he usually does. And they did custom tints for all those. So what we'll do is uh, try to make certain that we have our specialist who does all of our tints for our stuff, basically match those up and make it to where there's an option if they wanna you know, um, have those lenses uh, made for them. And then basically we just charge cost on the lenses. We just try to make it to where their collection is more complete. I guess is what I'd probably say. Because um, that's what myself and probably all of them that are on there are just trying to do is have the most complete collection. I think it's pretty cool to hear from one of them that's on there that says he tracked this frame down that was, you know, in Moscow and um, he had to buy, he had to get this exact color and so on and, and was able to track it down. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot worse things to be collecting out there than, than pairs of eyewear. I have every pair. I started collecting the Iron Man sunglasses in 2010. My first pair was the, the Ray-Ban RB3320s, and then I really dove hardcore into it with Iron Man 2, but I didn't get into that until probably 2013 when I got in touch with Jason from Initium. And that's when I had to have every pair that came out, and that's when I started really following which ones he wore. I, I am naturally a collector, just at heart. I, when I was a kid, I started collecting baseball cards, X-Men cards, comic books, toys, everything. So collecting has been in my blood for, God, since I was probably six years old. Um, with sunglasses, I feel like with, when I have the exact, or the exact pair, that I feel like I'm a little bit more connected to the character because I can, if I want to pretend that I'm Tony Stark, I can put the shades on and find a suit that looks kind of like his. But yep, I'm Tony Stark. Shave the goatee in if I want to. And here we are, I just like Tony Stark. But I think finding them, especially with the rare sunglasses that are hard to get, and when you finally get that victory of finding them and you're like, I got this pair. Finally, it took me hundreds of dollars and hours and hours and hours of finding them. And when you have the pair in your hands, you feel a little bit more complete. But putting them on is an entirely different story. That's when you can become that character. I know you've talked to a few of the VIPs of our of our brand that uh, carry or have everything from all those movies, and I do as well. So I do have all those pieces. Um, uh, luckily, I also have pieces that were on set pieces. So those are ones that I've, I've held on to. We have donated some of those in the past to different charities, and I will probably end up doing the rest of them as well. But I still did uh, hold on to. Um, different ones from different movies that, you know, um, there was a part in that movie or something that um, uh, meant something special to me, so I held on to some of the styles that we used in that movie. Don't do anything I would do, and definitely don't do anything I wouldn't do. There's a, there's a little gray area in there, and that's where you operate. So in Spider-Man, they actually started off with all of our frames and then changed some of the frames out. So for instance, we have a sterling silver frame that came with a lens shape. Um, that they ended up using in the car scene with the silhouette lens. So um, the frame was too heavy because it was uh, pure sterling silver, so it had some weight to it. Um, so we were told that, that it was just too heavy to use and it was sliding off of his nose. So that one wasn't used at that time. And then we had a frame that had the same tint that was used and they used a vintage frame for that um, and used our tint um, that we had in a different uh, that we had in an all-in frame for them. And then so they used that same tint coating and then just put it in that older style of frame. So then what we did is check and see if those are available, if there's uh, tooling and molds that we can actually purchase from the original company, if they're still in business. And then if there's a need, then we would remake them. 
the Roy Tower frame. That was a frame from the 80s. Um, there was a couple of them around. We bought up as many of them as we could when that happened. There was like three or four. I think the last one we paid like $1,500 for. But what we did is we got those in place so that we could take them apart and have our factory remake the tool, all the tooling on that and just basically redo the whole frame. We try to find out if there's anybody that actually owns those rights to that still at that point in time. Um, that company has been gone for so long that there was nobody there to, to get in touch with. For instance, like the Mosley Tribe frame, um, the, all those, the tooling for that frame was gone. Um, so we had to track that down and see what factory in China had it and then see if we could purchase that tooling. There were there were three pair of Mosley Tribes Bromley on eBay. There were two blues and a tortoise shell. Oh, no, sorry, Havana. And I didn't win the Havana ones. I kind of wanted them because they looked closer to the burgundy than the blue ones did, but I really liked the blue ones. I feel like they would go more with anything that I would really usually wear. Um, so I bought the pair, and then Jason actually won the other pair of blue ones on eBay. So that's what I think he used to base his frames on. There's this concept in optical, uh, because there was a thing on 2020 out there that talked about um, that Luxottica has this huge monopoly and there's only so many factories out there. Um, that, that's not the case. There are hundreds of factories, but it is still a small community. So basically what we can do is contact the 10 that we know, the four that we work with, and have them start checking around to see who made those. And so when you have a brand um, like a Mosley Tribes brand, um, they're going to generally know the three factories that were making those frames back in the day. This last week, we have had 25 emails asking about the uh, the frame that he's wearing when he's in the do Randy's Donut. And I don't know if maybe sometimes it's that a someone says something on a blog or something about a certain particular frame, um, but we get these uh, different times where we'll just have tons of emails asking about a particular frame. And right now that's the frame that they're asking about. Um, so we tell them, we'd refer them to contact Bond Zipper. Our partnership with Marvel is basically, uh, they don't pay us, we don't pay them. It's steady business and income. I mean, those styles, even from the first ones we did in Iron Man 2, still still sell on a daily basis. So for us, it's something that's uh, great. And it, it, it makes it to where we can do more with Marvel. We are working on specialized pieces where we're actually designing new styles for one of those movies and two of those shows. Two of those shows are actually filming right now in the studios that Marvel has in Georgia. So these two here are two of the five frames that we used for Avengers 2. When he pulls them out of his pocket and the Audi pulls up, the Audi was meant to match the tips on the back or the tips were meant to match the Audi. <laughs> Depends on what industry you're in. This was from Iron Man 2 from the courtroom scene. Um, that's probably our most famous piece, I would probably say, from when he gives the thumbs up. We had four frames on Robert Downey Jr. and one on Justin Hammer in one movie. So it's kind of see, you're cool in the Monaco scene. You can actually see our logo on both the villain and the superhero. This is the concept two from Spider-Man Homecoming. Um, this frame here is a different color in that. This is on set right now. Um, so I'm guessing we'll probably see that in one of the two films that Marvel is doing right now. Uh, these are two styles that uh, we are using in the Disney Plus series um, of the collaboration, I guess, uh, what, Falcon and Bucky, I believe, Wanda and Vision. We, use the, we have different names that they give us for it, so, I, so it's a, a different name than what they use for Disney on those, but these are two of the styles that will be in those. Marvel went ahead and they actually made a CGI frame to look like one of my real frames. To me, 10 years of working with them and then to their, well, um, biggest money-making movie of all time, and they went ahead and spent uh, what would have to be tons of money <laughs> to make a CGI frame of an Initium frame. So they could literally copy any frame, make it simple. They don't need to have the guitar picks on the back or the swoosh on the side there. And they went ahead and copied it exactly. It's pretty cool to see your frame in there, but to see them actually make one uh, was even more impressive. Sales gone through the roof. I mean, it's to a level that you, you can't forecast, which is good and it's bad. Your average pair of Dita glasses takes anywhere from eight to nine months to make. So we have a frame here that was released in 2015. We've done different iterations of it, so it's continual. It's part of the core Dita family. Um, but we really didn't have the insight to know like this was gonna take off to the level that it did. There's no taking shortcuts. There's no, and I've tried, believe me. I've called the Japan factory myself, doing everything I could, sending them 
clips of the trailer, sending them pictures of Robert Downey Jr., pictures of Tom Holland wearing this frame in the movie. And it's still, we can't take shortcuts on the level of quality that we put out there. We will not see any more product until probably spring of 2020. I knew it had to do with uh, Infinity War and Endgame, but I didn't know how. I had no idea what was happening. So I just produced what they asked for. And um, with the help of Cody, it, 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 it worked out amazingly, obviously. I would say overall sales per year, we probably do about 25% in sales that are from uh, Marvel, from Marvel movies. This happened organically. Realistically, if you wanted to pay for this sort of media exposure, it would cost millions of dollars. But here it is, we created a product that we hoped it would get to that level and it did, and it's a little serendipitous, but you know, we're grateful for it. It's very surreal. It's, it's very surreal. It's, you, you see something, you know, as big as that in the, in the movie screen and, you know, knowing a whole movie is based around it, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. It's like you want to stand up in the theater and say, I designed that, you know, like, you know, I did that, but no one's going to really care. It's honestly a crapshoot. Sometimes you get lucky and it makes its way to a trailer or it makes its way to a poster. Um, but the scope of where this one went to was nothing that we could even comprehend or fathom. And we've been very, very blessed to have that work out for us. Style-wise, film-wise, I mean, it doesn't really get any bigger than Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man.